Hello and welcome to Gateway Alliance Church's online worship service. We're so thankful that you are joining us today and we trust that God is going to do some amazing things. I'm Pastor Adam. I'm the lead pastor of all the Gateway campuses and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. And so we want to get to know you before we even start off the service because we want to figure out how can we minister to you, how can we bless you. And so there are a couple different ways that we can connect together. One of those is that you can go on to our website, www.gatewayalliance.com slash contact, and it takes you right to our online connect card so that you can fill that out. Let us know how we can keep in contact with you with all the different ministries that happen in our online campus, or if you're interested in ministries that happen at our physical locations in Sydney or Appalachian as well. Or you can go on and there is a QR code in the announcement slides that were just at the beginning of this time. Scan that and it'll take you there as well. So make sure to let us know who you are. You can comment in the comment sections below on whichever um, streaming source you're using right now and we would love to be a part of how you are just progressing with what God is doing in our lives. One of the reasons we're able to do a lot of the ministries as we start off is that uh, people like you give so generously to the work of, of Gateway Alliance. And so if this is something that you feel led to do, you can go onto our website, uh, gatewayalliance.com slash give, or you can scan the QR code at the beginning as well. That'll take you to an online giving platform. And uh, if you feel like giving to the work of Gateway Alliance through the Lord Jesus Christ, we would love to have you partner with us in that way. And that's a way that we can do all of the different ministries, whether it's online or in person around the world that affect the lives of people in some very, very powerful ways. And so online worship, if you're not familiar with it, is something that can be a little a little different for us, right? And so I wanted to just talk to you really quickly before we start our service today of how can you effectively participate in worship today instead of just observe. And one of those would be is to make this a time that is very intentional. You know, God set this aside apart for our day for us to be able to connect with him. And so can we rid the distractions that are around us? Maybe not fold the laundry right away, whatever it might be, but get our Bible, our Bible app out, whatever it is, our drink, sit down, open it up, and just be ready to hear all that Jesus has for us today. So make sure that you're making this an intentional time because I know God wants to speak. And so I'm excited for what's going to take place in our service today. Um, we're going to be able to hear a great message from Pastor Mitch, our Appalachian campus pastor, who is going to be talking about one of our what if statements again. And it's coming from the book of Habakkuk. What if, um, you know, we're, we're not necessarily just disagreeing with God, but what happens when we see God do some bad things around us and we don't necessarily like it? That's what the book of Habakkuk is all about. We're going to sing. We're going to talk about what binds us together, especially in this day and age where it seems like everything is trying to pull us apart. And so we're going to see Jesus do some amazing things. So let me pray with us before we start our service. Jesus, thank you again for allowing us to come together for allowing us to be in your presence. Jesus, do amazing things in us today, we pray, as we bring our worship to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's worship the Lord together.
as the church, as believers in Jesus Christ, have you ever thought about the very things that unite us, that we all have in common with one another? You know, the ancient church fathers did, and they called these things creeds, right? They are statements that define the very basic nature of who we are. And so coming up next, we're going to show you a little video today that really talks about all that Jesus has done to bind us together as we take a look at the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. I believe in God. The Father Almighty, creator of heaven and, and an earth. earth. I believe I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, Son our Lord, Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, fue crucificado, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Espíritu Santo. The Holy Catholic Church. The, the communion, communion of saints. saints. The forgiveness, forgiveness of, of sins. sins. The resurrection of the body. And the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Hey, how's it going, Gateway Church? My name is Mitch. I'm one of the pastors of Gateway Alliance Church, um, the campus pastor at Appalachian, and I'm so glad that you decided to join us today. We are once again doing a sermon on the What If series. Uh, for those of you who remember last week, we covered the What If We Disagree. What if we disagree with God? What if we disagree with each other? And today, today's sermon's a little tricky. The reason today's sermon's a little tricky is for two reasons. One, we're going to be studying the book of Habakkuk. I don't know if you pronounce it Habakkuk or Habakkuk or some other variation, but the reason that's tricky is because, well, I know how popular Habakkuk is. I know that you know exactly where Habakkuk is in the Bible. <laughs> Somewhere in the New Testament, right? No, no, the reason it's tricky is because I hope to explain to you this awesome three-chapter book it's such a, a, a rich book, and it's often considered not as important as the other books in the Bible. It's the eighth out of 12 minor prophets that goes before God and has a personal dialogue with God. He, has a, he, has a, he prays to God. And this is cool because he's the only prophet that doesn't condemn or challenge another nation. So he's unique. It's just going to be difficult to, to explain the entire book of Habakkuk in like 20 minutes. The other reason this is tricky, the other reason the sermon is tough is because we're looking at the question, what if God allows bad things? That's a big question. That's kind of difficult to answer. And, and I hope we can see in this book that the Holy Spirit inspired, I hope that we can see through the prophet uh, an answer that's super clear and that helps us to have more joy in God. But I understand for those of you who are going through pain, for those of you who are struggling, struggling with difficulties or, or circumstances that are kind of unbearable or, or hard, there's nothing I'm going to say in the next 20 minutes that's going to take away that pain. You see, mentally, I might be able to provide an answer that's beneficial, but the reason the sermon is tricky is because this won't heal your difficult circumstances immediately. No, this is hopefully, this book of Habakkuk is going to be helpful in the process that God wants to take you on as you're going through these difficult circumstances. And for those of you who aren't in pain, I'm legitimately happy for you, but I would still advise that you perk your ears to this sermon because we all will go through pain and we all will go through circumstances. We all will face bad things. Habakkuk offers us an answer to those bad things. What if God allows bad things? Before I start speaking any further, I think it would be beneficial for us to rely on the Holy Spirit. If he inspired the word, then he should inspire our minds to be able to understand and accept and to hear the words that he inspired. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving us 66 books in your Bible. Thank you for inspiring your word that you desire to answer questions that we might have had growing up that are 
societies might have collectively that we might have had as a human race throughout human history. We pray that you would speak to us, that you would inspire our minds to understand your word. And I thank you, God, that you are holy and good and that you sometimes allow bad things, but you never leave us nor forsake us. God, please speak to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the book of Habakkuk starts off, the first four verses in chapter 1, starts off with Habakkuk complaining. He's asking God this really, really big question. God, why do you allow bad things? He looks around at his country, and he says, look at the injustice. Look at all the sin and the evil and the wickedness and the people turning away from God. Does that sound familiar? Habakkuk in four verses says, God, how can you allow so much evil? How can you allow so much bad? First four verses, Habakkuk lodges his his argument or his complaint or his questions, and he he asks a pretty interesting big question. I think this question's been asked even as far back as Greek philosophers. There's this Greek philosopher who became famous. His name is Epicurus, and he said he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe in an all-powerful or all good God. He said, if God was all powerful, then he must not be very good to allow bad things. Or, if he was all good, then he must not be all powerful. He must be impotent to allow bad things to happen. Let's read the first four verses that Habakkuk uh, prays to God, and that actually mimics this kind of ideal, this kind of question that we're asking in the What If series. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. You know, it's not wrong to ask questions of God. It's not wrong to ask big questions. <laughs> our big questions are not bigger than our big God. In fact, throughout the Bible, we see heroes of the faith asking really hard questions, challenging God with these questions. Jeremiah asked God why. Moses was reluctant when he was called, and he said, God, how, how could you allow this? Why would you do this? King David even, in Psalms 4 and Psalms 6, check it out. King David asked God a very similar question. Why do you allow wicked men to thrive? Why do you allow the unjust to succeed? And King David, mighty King David, he's crying. He cries so much that he soaks his pillow and he soaks his couch in tears. The same King David who who defeated all his enemies in hand-to-hand combat is soaking his pillow with tears because he looks at this question and he he can't fathom how God can allow injustice. My point, though, is Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Moses, David, all these godly men in their prayers to God asked him, how can you allow bad things? And it's not wrong for us to ask God questions like this. If you're not looking at the the heroes of the faith, maybe you would look at someone secular like Galileo. Galileo believed in God, and he has this quote that I think of often. He says, I do not feel obligated to believe that the same God who has endowed us with sense, reason, and intellect has intended us to forego their uses. So many people say you shouldn't question God or, or it says it in the Bible, don't, you know, God works in mysterious ways. They try and kick the can down the road and not answer that question or, or not even allow themselves to question God. No, God encourages it. God wants us to ask big questions and there's nothing too big he can't handle. This what if question, what if God allows bad things, is actually quite beautiful. To question God in this way is beautiful because it's meant to show us that we're not at God's level. If we were to pose that question, God, how could you allow bad things? It must mean that we don't have the answer. It must mean that we are not capable of solving that problem. We don't have the intellect to understand it. We don't have the creativity he has to understand it. In fact, our impotence is exposed when we ask this question. This question is supposed to lead us to God. So my first answer 
for what if God allows bad things? He allows bad things to start us looking for him, to set our awareness on him. How is your awareness? Let's take a moment to watch this awareness test video. There's this test that came out uh, maybe like 13 years ago that tests your awareness. And if you haven't seen it already, that's great. If you have seen it, bear with me. Try and, try and get the accurate count to this video. Take a look. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? It's easy to miss something you're not looking for. When we ask the what if question, what if God allows bad things? It's supposed to set us on a process of searching for God, of being more aware of God, that we would deepen our search for him, deepen our relationship with him, our awareness of him. So Habakkuk asks in these first four verses of, of his book, God, why? How? How can you allow bad things? And God answers. God says, you know what? You're absolutely right. I see the bad things you're referring to. What I'm going to do is I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. For those of you who don't know the Babylonians, the, a similar question or a similar kind of context that we would have today is if you and I were to look at God, if you and I were to question God and say, God, how can you allow social injustice in the United States? How can you allow there to be economic injustice or violence against women or child abuse? How can you allow riots in the streets and, and the law to be crippled? How can you allow evil men to, to turn away from you in this country? And God would respond with, I see you. You're absolutely right. I know exactly what you're talking about. I am going to raise up Al-Qaeda and the Taliban to take over the United States. Or if he said something similar like, I'm going to bring back the Soviet Union and the Third Reich and they're going to team up and they will be my instruments to punish the United States. We would not like that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about you. I would disagree with God. My prayer life would uh, be either stunted or changed dramatically to the point of, God, don't allow that. I don't like that idea. I don't like that answer that you just gave me. I like the country that we have right now. There's no way a more evil country would be useful in taking us over when we're acting kind of evil. That's how Habakkuk felt when God answered his first set of questions. God said, I am going to raise up the Babylonians, and they will be my instrument. I'm going to use them. This was very scary for Habakkuk. You know why the Babylonians, if I can give you a quick history lesson, they had a kind of scorched earth policy. When they took over a place, they really took over. They destroyed everything. Habakkuk hasn't seen it yet. The Babylonians haven't invaded yet. But the Babylonians will invade the kingdom of Judah. Last week, Pastor Adam talked about how the Bible hasn't been proven wrong and that prophecies came to pass and were fulfilled. This is true in Habakkuk. Babylon invaded the kingdom of Judah, and they burned down every building that was three stories tall or taller. The king's palace, they burned it down. They took the king, and they killed his kids, and they gouged out his eyes in front of him. Well, they killed his kids and then gouged out his eyes. That's the last thing he saw. And then there was the temple of the Lord, a place where people from Africa and Asia and Europe could come together in one spot to worship the Lord, where the Lord resided. It was one of the ancient wonders of the world and existed in the kingdom of Judah. And when the Babylonians came, they burned it to the ground. The Babylonians were one of the most evil superpowers that ever existed in modern-day Iraq. That's where they originated. And this is how God describes the Babylonian horses, just the horses alone. He says they're like fast like leopards, and depending on your translation... They would fly down like, like vultures. You know, they were just so quick. They were so deadly. Let me read to you God's answer in Habakkuk 1, 8 and 9. 
In referring to the Babylonians, God says, they are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand, and boy, did they gather captives. The Babylonians took on slaves, and they humiliated their slaves. They would trot them out with, uh, you know how most times if a, a country invaded another country and they took slaves, they would put shackles on their wrists or on their ankles, and they would have them all move as one into the exile or into the country of origin. The Babylonians, single file. Everybody had a hook in their nose that they would pull out they would pull their slaves with hooks in their noses, or, and this is interesting that Habakkuk would, would describe the word like this, or with hooks in their lips. You see, when God answers, I'm going to bring up the Babylonians to conquer you, Habakkuk refuses and he says, God, why would you do this? The Babylonians are like an evil fisherman that casts his net out and captures a ton of helpless fish. We are like helpless fish without a leader. He describes the Babylonians as this evil fisherman. And if you look at chapter 1, verse 15, Habakkuk says, The wicked foe, Babylon, the evil fisherman, pulls them up with hooks and catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. (laughs) It's just, um, I don't know if interesting is the most accurate word. But to say, hey, the Babylonians are scary. They capture men like they're fish. And then for the Babylonians to come onto the scene decades later, trotting out the people of God with hooks in their lips like a fish. We got to be careful when we pray, I guess. We got to be careful in the way that we pray. I don't think that's an actual application. I'm just saying that it's interesting Habakkuk would prophesy even when he's not trying to. So God answers, I'm going to raise up the Babylonians. And Habakkuk continues to ask, why? How could you allow this bad thing? And then God responds, okay? So you have Habakkuk questions, God responds, Habakkuk questions. And before I tell you what God says next, I want to change the what-if question. Because the first what-if question, what if God allows bad things, I think is kind of beautiful. Like I said, it exposes our limitations, It shows us that we don't know why he does that. We are limited in our thinking. We're limited in our ability to save. But let me ask a darker question. Let me ask a question that uh, the implications are something I don't think we want. What if God were to stop all bad things? Initially, this sounds beautiful, right? I mean, what if God were to stop the 19 Al-Qaeda operatives? on September 11th. If he just, if God tipped off the police and they arrested those terrorists, there would be no 9-11, right? What if God stopped the events of Pearl Harbor? The Japanese attacked the United States with 406 um, fighter jets. What if God stopped them? What if the oil in the jets just evaporated and the Japanese were never able to attack Pearl Harbor? What if God stopped the United States from giving blankets filled with smallpox to the Native American population? What if the blankets just got lost in shipment? This is a big what if, right? These are big historical events. But what about um, less big events? What if God stopped all bad things? Like if there was a person who got drunk and they were driving, what if God stopped that person from getting behind the wheel and he just lost his keys? Where would we want God to stop the bad things? Because he would stop all bad things, right? Not just historical events, not just big car accident type situations. Have you ever been lied to? I've been lied to. I don't like it. What if God stopped all lies? No one would ever lie about you. No one would ever lie to you. God would stop all exaggerations of the truth. He would stop all half-truths or gossip. I especially dislike when people gossip about me. What if God stopped people from saying gossip? Or when people judge us, what if God stopped people from saying these judgmental things about us? 
or just making any kind of judgment? What if God stopped you from lying or stopped you from gossiping or stopped you from judging? Because we wouldn't just want him to stop big historical event type stuff that are bad. We'd want him to stop small, smaller bad things. And not just actions, bad things, but like speaking bad things, right? What if God stopped all bad things? Have you had a bad thought, a morally wrong thought, an evil thought? What if God stopped that thought as well? How many, stop, uh, how many thoughts would he have to stop? The fact of the matter is, if God were to stop all bad things, he'd have to stop so many actions, so many verbal communications, so many thoughts. He'd have to stop us. Thank God he allows bad things. You and I are so prone to evil. You and I are so prone to sin. We naturally do bad things. We do it so frequently and so often, we don't even realize we're doing it. Subconsciously, we do bad things. What if he were to stop bad things? He would stop us. We wouldn't exist. In fact, we wouldn't have a way to God. We wouldn't have a way to have a relationship with God. Now, here's the gospel. I'm sure you've heard it already. Jesus paid. Because, because God is all good and because he's all powerful, he sent Jesus to be the payment for our bad things, to be the payment for our sin. I mean, Jesus suffered mockery, and he was crucified, and the wrath of God was poured out on him. And these are just a couple of things that happened to Jesus where he paid for our sin. He died in place of us. He died the death we should have died. The baddest bad thing, holy, perfect, good Jesus, crucified for our sins. The baddest bad thing turned out to be the goodest good thing for all human history. What I'm describing to you is the gospel. And there's many ways we can phrase it. I think a very clear way is in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. Paul, who very clearly understands the gospel and is trying to articulate it to the believers in Rome, says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed. From faith, for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, Paul is quoting something in the Old Testament. He's quoting a scripture in the Old Testament. I bet by now you can guess where he's quoting. The righteous shall live by faith. When Paul is quoting, he's quoting Habakkuk. I told you that Habakkuk asked a hard question. God answered. Habakkuk asked a second set of hard questions. God responds. He doesn't necessarily respond the way Habakkuk wanted. In fact, he's not obligated to respond at all, if we're being honest. But he does. He responds in the form of Jesus. And he responds verbally to Habakkuk. He says in chapter 2, verse 4, in reference to that evil fisherman, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Thank God he allows bad things. And thank God he provided a way for us to be with him, that he allowed the baddest bad thing to work out in the goodest good way. that when we see evil, we know to live lives trusting God. So, we ask again, what if God allows bad things? God allows bad things that we might put our faith in him. He answers us by saying, the righteous shall live by faith. He answers Habakkuk back then in the Old Testament, and then he answers for you and I in our context in the New Testament, through Jesus, that we shall live by faith. And that's how the righteousness is revealed. I'd like to make a final point, you know. Uh, on my phone here, I guess I don't need to show you, but I can pull up a menu to my favorite Chinese restaurant in Sydney, New York. It's called China City. And I can read you the menu. I can show you the pictures on my phone. I can tell you all the ingredients and a little bit of how it's made. But really, no matter how much I recommend this food to you, 
until you eat it, you won't know how good the Chinese food is here in Sydney, New York. I think that's the job of the pastor, right? I can show you or even give you a kind of reading here of Habakkuk. I can tell you what's in it. I can tell you who's involved and the different ingredients that made this book the book that it is. But really, until you eat it, you won't know how good, how good this book is, how good Habakkuk is. Until you develop your own relationship with Jesus in private and in public, you won't know. I can't cover the entire book in the time allotted us. But I do want to kind of briefly skim over the rest of this book. Habakkuk receives his answer from God. He is told the righteous will live by faith. And chapter 2 ends with God reminding Habakkuk where he is. That he is high and lofty. That he is sitting in his holy temple. That God is in control. He might raise up the Babylonians. But they're not going to last more than 100 years. The Babylonians are not too powerful for God. The wicked men of Israel are not too strong and too resistant to God. God is sovereign and in control. The fact that God might use Babylon does not mean that he endorses Babylon. The fact that God might use sin for good does not mean he delights in sin. It says here in chapter 2, verse 20, But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And then there's chapter 3. Chapter 3, Habakkuk immediately says his prayer. The rest of this chapter should be read or should be actually sung to the background of some music. So his final prayer is, is a song of praise. He praises God. He understands that God is sovereign, and he praises God for all the things that God has done in his life. In fact, he looks back to all the good things God has already done in order to give praise to the Lord. He, he references times of uh, the Exodus. I don't know if you remember in the book of Exodus, the people of God were enslaved, and then by faith, they left their slave chains and entered into the promised land. It's kind of a cool Christian allegory, right? You and I were slaves to sin, and then by faith, we leave our slave chains and enter into the promised land. Yeah, Habakkuk remembers the exile, and he praises God for the good things that he did then. And then he looks to the future knowing that if he trusts God, God will be there for him. His faithfulness will allow him to have righteousness before God. That's exactly what we should do if God allows bad things, is be reminded of how much he loves us. When God wants to, to remind us how much he loves us, when God wants to show his sovereignty or, or the depths of his love, he tells us to look to the past. Look to the things he's already done in your life. In fact, Romans chapter 5, verse 8 is a great example of looking to the past to answering the questions of the present and the future. Can I read it to you? Romans 5, 8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's read that scripture again. God demonstrates his love for us in this. Demonstrates is a pre present tense. Future tense. How does he demonstrate his love for us? Current tense. How will he demonstrate his love for us? God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Past tense. He died. If you want to know how deeply God loves you, look to the past. Look to the cross. Habakkuk looks to the exile. He looks to the time when God liberated him, liberated his people from sin, from slavery, from a hopeless situation from bad things. And then he praises God for the rest of the book. He even references, hey, if there's a famine, I will praise you, God. If we look at chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, it says, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my Savior. Habakkuk didn't put his faith in bad things. He didn't put his faith in circumstances. He didn't allow his bad things, circumstances, to rob him of the joy that he found in the Lord. By the end of this book, Habakkuk embodies what it means to live by faith. By the end of this book, Habakkuk realizes that he was so focused on his circumstances and not focused on God. So what if God allows bad things? Remember God. 
don't keep your eyes on the bad things. Don't keep your eyes on the circumstances. Those things are going to be hard. Those things are going to be messy. It's going to be uncomfortable. But God is in control. God has already shown us that he loves us. God has already given us air and breath in our lungs. God has already given us literacy. God has already given us so much. God will be there for us in our present and in our future. God will be there to save us. Habakkuk, by the end of the book, calls God his Savior. And that's where our joy should be. Our joy should not be robbed by our circumstances. Our joy should not be robbed by our bad things. Our joy should be found in the Lord. God, thank you so much for giving us this word. Thank you for these three chapters. Like a menu, I feel like you've given me the responsibility of describing what's on the menu, but I pray for the people watching at home that they would go and they would read this three-chapter book, this three-chapter sneak peek of the prayer life of a prophet that you loved, and you show us your love through the love that you showed him. So thank you, God, for this book. Thank you for giving this to us. Thank you for inspiring it to us. For those of us going through hard circumstances or bad things or pains in life, I pray that you would show yourself to be the healer. You would show yourself to be the comforter. And like this book suggests and like the overall theme that you seem to be coming in with this book, show us that you are our savior. Our futures are never brighter than when we focus our eyes on you, than when we trust in you and we are developing our awareness of who you are. Oh God, you're so worthy of being praised. You're so holy and good. And it is in that powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Have a good day, church.